Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure for me to resume the on-site event after uh, more than two years absence or a break. And of course, we still need uh, to be very careful enough uh, to uh, prevent the spread of infection, but uh, I know the on-site event has a great advantage. <clears throat> we can share uh, the excitement, passion, and insight of the speaker more uh, easily since we are in the same space. Uh, if the circumstance allows, we will uh, combine uh, the on-site event with uh, the online one from now on. Oh, excuse me to uh, uh, not having uh, introduced me uh, to you and started to talk. I, my name is Haneda Masashi, uh, the director of Tokyo College and today's uh, MC. Uh, I am de uh, delighted to welcome Mr. Bill Emmott uh, as the first speaker of the resumed on-site event this time. In fact, he was uh, the uh, first speaker of the whole series of uh, lectures organized by Tokyo College. On 15th uh, May 2019, exactly three years uh, ago, he gave a talk uh, on Japan's far, uh, far more female future. It was a kind of inaugural lecture uh, of Tokyo College, founded just three months uh, before that. Now you understand well how important Mr. Emot is for Tokyo College. He's certainly a great supporter for us. So let me introduce uh, Mr. Bill Emot briefly. He is a renowned writer, lecturer, and consultant on international affairs based in Oxford in the UK and Dublin in Ireland. He was editor-in-chief of The Economist, the world's uh, leading weekly magazine for more than a decade till 2006. He plays an important role in various public uh, sectors. For example, he's chairman of the Japan Society uh, of the UK and is chairman of the International Institute for Strategic Studies a London-based think tank, and above all, uh, Ushioda Fellow of Tokyo College at the University of Tokyo. He is the author of 14 uh, books, including the latest on Japan's female future I mentioned earlier. Well, the world has uh, changed dramatically since his first, uh, his last lecture of three years ago. A lot of things have happened, including the pandemic, which has prevented, still, still prevent international communication seriously. Mr. Emmott will give a talk on this changing world with the title of uh, Trade War, Pandemic, War in Ukraine, what we know and don't know about the new political and the economic order. So please welcome Mr. Emmott. Uh, Mr. Emmott, the floor is yours. Well, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. And I thank you, uh, Professor Haneda, for not only your very, very kind introduction, but also for bringing me here to Japan for my first visit in two and a half years. And I'm thrilled, really thrilled, to be back here at Tokyo College and to be able to give this lecture in person and to see again many friends uh, here in the uh, room here today. But I'm thrilled also to see with my own eyes how much the great new institution of Tokyo College has developed and grown since that first inaugural public lecture for the college uh, three years ago. So I give my very warm congratulations to you, Professor Haneda, and to all of your colleagues for your vision, your energy, your dedication, and your great achievement amid such difficult times, especially during the past two years or more. And the topic of my lecture today concerns precisely those difficult times that we have been living through and what they might mean for us all, 
as individuals, as scholars, as countries, as the world. My aim will be to try to offer some thoughts about where the world is heading in political and economic terms, while also highlighting where the biggest uncertainties and unknowns may lie. These have been difficult times, but of course I am not just referring to the terrible long global public health crisis we have been confronted with over these two years. In fact, my proposition to you today is that just in the past five years, we have seen three major events in the world that have shattered or broken the assumptions that many of us were making about the direction of world affairs. What were these three major events? First, the trade war that began in 2018 between the world's two economic and political superpowers, the United States and China. This was a trade war that also brought trade battles between uh, the US and its allies in Europe and Japan, but thereby this event broke assumptions about America's role and I would argue about the future of institutions of global governance. The second major event was, of course, the global coronavirus pandemic. This pandemic has, over the past two years, caused, at the latest estimate, over, and I think this map, there we are, the, the, at the latest estimate, over six million officially recognized deaths, in a, and, but in reality, somewhere more than 20 million so-called excess deaths. In other words, deaths in excess over what would have been expected on normal trends. These estimates have been made by my excellent former colleagues at The Economist and are updated daily. I'm afraid I haven't updated since April the 29th. The number will be even a bit higher. And this is the distribution around the world of that excess deaths and the worst countries are the dark red, which include certainly the United States, but also notably Russia. Because the third major event has been Russia's invasion of Ukraine, the current phase of which began on February the 24th. This is an invasion which has shocked the world, not simply because it is a brutal invasion by a former imperial power of its neighbor, and former colony, which had become independent by mutual consent in 1991, and not simply because of the war crimes which we have seen demonstrated through the world's media. No, this invasion is shocking and in fact shatters assumptions also because it is a war chosen by a military superpower with the aim of changing borders by force, an act that was supposed to be ruled out by the United Nations Charter of 1945. And even more shattering has been the fact that this is an invasion by, a, by the country in possession of the world's largest arsenal of nuclear weapons. This invasion has raised the possibility that the great taboo on the use of nuclear weapons uh, an assumption which has prevailed ever since the terrible events in Hiroshima and Nagasaki on August the 6th and 9th, 1945, could soon be broken. We don't know whether that will happen, but we do know that Russia has made threats that it could use such terrible weapons so as to influence and deter its adversaries. This again breaks a long-standing assumption about how the original nuclear superpowers would behave. So I believe that these three major events, trade war, pandemic, and war in Ukraine, have shattered some important assumptions. Of course, those assumptions were also themselves open to debate and disagreement. Not everyone believed in them or shared them. Nonetheless, what these major events have done is perhaps not so much as to change the direction of world history, 
but rather to widen the range of possible futures beyond those futures that had been implied by our previous assumptions. Let me define what I mean by these assumptions. And by assumptions, I mean commonly held ideas or narratives which shaped policy and attitudes, especially attitudes about what were the range of possible outcomes that we as individuals, governments, companies, scholars needed to plan for and think about. Going back a decade or so, I think that five main assumptions had become well established. The first, perhaps rather obvious assumption, was that we face a new era of great power competition as China rises. But an era in which there were other rising powers, such as India, Brazil, and even Russia, acting as balancing forces. Conflict between the superpowers course looked theoretically possible, but unlikely, in part because of the role of nuclear weapons and the deterrence concept of mutually assured destruction. Moreover, the rise of other countries in addition to China made us expect that power would be distributed broadly during the 21st century, rather than being focused narrowly in a small number of countries. Especially given that broad distribution of power, the second assumption was that increasingly inclusive global institutions would be crucial to manage that rise. And those global institutions would evolve from the institutions and rules that had been set up in the post-war decades. Examples include the G20, the World Trade Organization, the World Health Organization, and also new regional institutions, such as the East Asia Summit, now the CPTPP, Comprehensive and Progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership, and many others. The growing need to confront the climate crisis would, some of us also thought, provide a strong incentive for collaboration, even between the greatest powers. Such institutions would gradually evolve away from being Western-led, and China would inevitably play a major role in the future development of these institutions. Third, I believe it was widely assumed that as a consequence, the acceptance by the United States of global institutions and support for those institutions would rise as the United States hegemonic power weakened, and as it came to recognize a need for a wider set of partners to achieve its goals. This would also be a logical way for the United States to manage the impact of China's rise. Fourth, despite China's rise and Russia's move back towards autocracy, I believe it was also assumed that democracies would prove more resilient than autocracies, thanks to superior accountability and free movement of information. This did not mean that we, we all believed in Francis Fukuyama's notion of the end of history, but I think it was widely thought that this political form of democracy would gradually prove more popular as middle classes grew in many countries, including China and as those middle classes came to demand that their interests and rights are defended. Fifth and finally, I suggest that we assumed that the globalization of trade, technology, and ideas that have facilitated the rise of new powers and this spread of wealth would continue and would help to discourage conflict and equalize progress around the world. Technology lies at the heart of this process of globalization, but is also accelerated through the exchange of ideas by that same globalization. None of these assumptions was held in absolute faith. We knew 
that progress would be turbulent. We knew that global institutions would often prove imperfect or flawed. We knew that the United States would resist global institutions from time to time, as it always has. We knew that democracy's stability could never be taken for granted. And we knew that globalization brings winners and losers, and so can cause political backlashes. We also knew that European history taught us that while economic interdependence may discourage conflict, it does not prevent it. Nevertheless, looking back a decade or more, I would say that those assumptions or this narrative still looked quite solid as we entered the second decade of the 21st centuries. Some of those assumptions had been given a severe test by the 2008 global financial crisis that brought the worst financial collapse in more than 70 years to the United States and to Europe with impact on the whole world. And the narrative had mostly passed that test. For the democracies of Europe and the United States had at that time proved resilient. The United States elected its first African-American president. Banking systems were saved through massive but skillful intervention by central banks. The euro area sovereign debt crisis was dangerous, but it was kept under control. Global institutions appeared to be strengthened by this experience with the creation of a more inclusive G20. And we saw a rising role in all kinds of institutions for China and for Chinese staff. The United States embraced and even at times encouraged these global institutions. Thanks to the 2008 financial crisis, globalization took some setbacks on some measures, but its basic direction remained intact and strong. Although great power competition was proving difficult to manage, dialogue was underway. Major tensions were being avoided. China was playing a growing role as lender and investor to poor countries all around the world, mostly making a constructive contribution to the reduction of poverty that took some burden away from the West, even if the West worried about China's growing political influence. But then came the three major game-changing or perhaps assumption-shattering events, trade war, pandemic, war in Ukraine. And as that title, Chronicle of Disasters Foretold, indicates what I think about those three events that they have in common is that all were predicted, but nobody could predict when such an event would happen. But many people predicted trade war, many people predicted pandemics, many people have predicted even a war concerning Russia and Ukraine, but they were still unpredictable in terms of actually happening. Did these events really shatter those assumptions that I've laid out, some of you may ask? I think that they did, if you define the assumptions the way that I have. But even if you disagree with that definition, another way of describing what has happened is that I think these three major events have revealed the fact that those assumptions were becoming incorrect or perhaps over-optimistic as time went by. And I would argue that following these events, historians may well conclude that such events exposed and accelerated existing trends which were destined to force us to change our assumptions, especially assumptions about the, the range of potential roads along which we might travel. How? Well, let's take those events in chronological order. First, the trade war that was launched by the Trump administration in 2018. To some people, this may seem quite a technical issue. The fact that the United States imposed tariffs on up to, of up to 25% on billions of dollars of imports from China looks quite dramatic to economists like me, 
but in principle, such a measure is technical, like adjusting tax rates. But my proposition is that this was a much bigger development than just an adjustment to tax rates. For it signaled not the embrace, but the rejection by the United States of the use of global institutions to manage great power competition. In fact, it signaled a belief among powerful factions in American life that those institutions are an enemy against American interests, not a friend, and must eventually be destroyed. The birth of the World Trade Organization in 1995 had been supposed to mean that trade wars would be a thing of the past. Disputes would in future be resolved at the World Trade Organization, and countries would never again use tariffs and other trade barriers as major weapons of economic or political competition. But President Trump and his trade representative Robert Lighthizer, a man familiar to Japanese officials for his role as a negotiator with Japan during the 1980s trade frictions, had evidently not read the WTO memo. Ignoring their WTO obligations and progressively weakening the WTO's dispute settlement function by refusing to allow new judges to be appointed, they declared trade war principally against China, raising tariffs on many goods to 25%, but also imposed trade penalties on Japan and Europe for aluminium and steel, supposedly on national security grounds. At the same time, the United States and China began a fierce competition over technology, using many different means to try to gain an advantage in what came at that time to be seen as the major measure of geopolitical leadership for this century. So this launch of trade war reflected two big things. One was that it reflected was that there had been delayed but actually serious damage to American democracy and social stability, thanks to the aftermath of the 2008 financial crisis, as grievances about inequality and other social problems culminated in the surprise election of Donald Trump as, as president in 2016. As in previous American economic crises, including in the 1980s, those grievances produced a strong backlash against trade and against globalization. But the second big thing that this signaled was or concerned the intensifying of US-China competition. In Donald Trump's mind, one measure of that competition was the US trade deficit with China, just as in the 1980s, the US trade deficit with Japan had become a prime political measure for some. But for a much wider part of the US political and business elites of both political parties, a much more important measure became technological competition, along with a growing fear that China might soon take the lead in that competition. During the Cold War between the Soviet Union and, and the West in the 1960s, such technological fears centered on space and led to the US's successful program to land on the moon, demonstrating by 1970 America's clear technological superiority in many fields with military applications. In today's competition with China, that technological fear is more diffuse. It extends widely across semiconductors, 5G and 6G telecoms, artificial intelligence, and of course space too. So that fear also became reflected in tough US measures against Chinese technology firms. These measures were partly against the theft of intellectual property, but extended also into more direct effect, efforts to disable or obstruct Chinese technological development. Such measures have become bipartisan in nature and are likely to stay and intensify in coming years. This development both reflected and generated fear on both sides, fear of falling behind in America fear in China of becoming deprived of crucial components and technologies. My former colleagues at The Economist described the economic result of this trade war 
as being a transfer of globalization to what they called slobalization, the slowing of globalization. But I would argue also that the political implications of what was happening were probably more serious than the economic ones. The general fact is that in 2020, we entered the second major event, the pandemic, at a time when relations between the two superpowers were already in a tense, even conflictual condition, but gladly not conflictual in a military sense. The technologi technological competition we were seeing was a sort of proxy battle. The coronavirus pandemic, of course, has been and still is a terrible event in terms of human health which has taught us many specific lessons about health, social policy, and about the power of science, lessons on which other people are much more qualified to comment than I am. But I think in addition, the coronavirus pandemic has taught us some important lessons about world affairs. First, it has showed that great power relations have become so tense that even when confronted by an undoubtedly common enemy, the new virus, the United States and China moved further apart, not closer. During the past two years, China and really the whole of the West have run completely separate res policy responses against this global health threat using different vaccines and different control methods. That's not what our assumptions would have predicted. We would have predicted collaboration in the front of that, of that common enemy. But second, the pandemic has shown us that global institutions, such as the World Health Organization, had already become weakened by lack of financing. And now, the pandemic has made them even weaker. Although the WHO tried to play a good role in, in terms of providing information to the world, it has been unable to play much of an operational role during the crisis. And any proposals that are now made for new operational roles for the WHO to prevent future pandemics are therefore doomed to fail in current circumstances of superpower competition. Third, the pandemic showed that disruptions such as a pandemic can cause very major supply chain problems in our global trading system. Disruptions which in combination with other factors can bring significant economic consequences, including inflation. Some of those disruptions prompted immediate calls for governments for the supply, or by governments for the supply of critical goods to be brought back home, reshored as Americans call it. But in practice, so far, those calls have not yet proved very effective or long-lasting. Fourth, the pandemic showed that although the world's richest countries, what we generally call the West, including Japan, had the financial tools to support their own economies and health systems in these extraordinary times, they had neither the willingness nor probably the resources to provide major support to the poorer countries of the world. Donations were made to support the distribution of vaccines in Africa, for example, including by Japan and by the US and by Europe. And efforts were made to soften the impact of sovereign debt crises, but those efforts were inadequate. Vaccine distribution remains highly unequal, as this map shows, with Africa a very long way behind um, the rest of the world. African countries may not directly resent this lack of support, but they have, I think, noted that the West cannot be relied upon in such an emergency, nor in fact can China, but that is perhaps another story. On the positive side, however, the pandemic arguably offered some support to two of my five assumptions. The most significant support is the fact that in 2021 and 2022, the pandemic is being brought under some sort of control, chiefly thanks to the continued and powerful globalization of technology, manufacturing, and trade. 
By this, I mean the fact that a small handful of researchers and pharmaceutical companies based in the United States, in the UK, in Germany, and in a different way in China, developed vaccines against COVID in record time, some of them using highly innovative technologies, and went on to produce more than 11 billion doses in just one year at factories distributed all over the world. Personally, I have been now, I've now been vaccinated four times in four inoculations using three of these vaccines, AstraZeneca, Pfizer, BioNTech, and Moderna. So I believe I am a walking example of bioscience globalization. The result is that if anyone to were to tell me that globalization is dead or is soon to be dead, I would be pretty worried, as that would make us less likely to be able to deal effectively and quickly with future pandemics. Moreover, this vaccine success demonstrated the continued superiority of the bioscience technologies in Europe and the United States compared with China. The mRNA vaccines developed in Germany and the US and the adenovirus vaccine developed in the UK have had far superior results compared with the two old-fashioned style Chinese vaccines. In fact, thanks to that technological superiority, a fear that did develop last year has proven to be unfounded. This was the fear that China's vaccine diplomacy exporting the Sinovac and Sinopharm vaccines to poorer countries would give China a lasting advantage in world affairs by creating new friends and dependencies. But it did not. Thanks to their lower efficacy and to the Western firm's success in overcoming production difficulties, the Western vaccines have been, become dominant everywhere except China, but dominant by purchases by the market, not by donation. And finally, that technological success in the advanced democracies also matched a social and political reality that was emerging. This is that although the European and American democracies proved quite bad at managing the health impact of the pandemic, especially during 2020, then they proved very effective at managing the economic, social, and political impacts over the longer term. During the pandemic, so far, democracies have proved highly resilient and, in fact, ultimately very capable of adaptation. It's doubtless too soon to come to a conclusive judgment about this, as 2008 shows us that the political aftermath of a shock can take time to show itself. But for the time being, the results are good. Democracies have proved quite a lot more resilient than many might have expected. Right now, in fact, the democracies look in better shape than China does, and are much better shape than Russia, which was hit bad by the pan bad, hard by the pandemic and failed to produce a vaccine that convinced its own people, let alone export markets. That failure and that weakness is probably an important background to the current war. So as 2022 began, we seemed to be able to draw some at least tentative conclusions. Democracies had proved resilient and were even in a recovery period. US-China competition looked tense and difficult and global institutions looked very broken. Climate offered the one chance for collaboration between the superpowers to be restarted and reshaped, although efforts to do so remained disappointing. And globalization was still intact and powerful, even if rocked by supply chain disruptions and new barriers against the movement of people. But then came the war in Ukraine. We are still only in the third month of that war. So we are all very familiar with the details of what has happened and is happening. So I won't go into lots of those details, especially military ones. Instead, I will underline what I think are some fundamental points about Russia's war in Ukraine that will have implications for the future. The first of those is that on February the 4th, as the Beijing Winter Olympic Games were opening, Russia's President Putin and China's Xi Jinping signed and published a joint long 
joint declaration about how those two superpowers now had a strategic partnership that would, quotes, know no limits. 2022, we should recall, is the 50th anniversary of President Richard Nixon's opening up of US relations with China, an opening which shocked Japan at the time, but which crucially created a working relationship between the West and China that came to be used to, op to oppose and to weaken the Soviet Union. In their February the 4th joint statement, Russia and China declared that they now have a working relationship that they will use to oppose and weaken the West. They declared that they want some very significant changes in the way the world security, political, and economic system is, is governed. They want an end to re any remaining domination by the West in general and the United States in particular. They claim that they want to increase the role of global multilateral institutions in global governance. But their words and, and Russia's subsequent actions showed that they consider that the superpowers, Russia and China, plus presumably the United States, can operate according to different rules, or rather, in fact, without any rules at all. For 20 days later, having waited until the closing ceremony of the Winter Olympics was complete, Putin ordered his, fuse, his forces to invade Ukraine, displaying that superpower contempt for the rules in a dramatic way. This brought a major war to the continent of Europe for the first time since 1945, a war coming right up to the borders of the European Union. But the important point here is that the war began with clear support from China and signaled that the Russia-China working relationship extends far be beyond trade. The second point to un underline about this war is that Russia's objectives, as laid down in speeches and articles by President Putin over many months and indeed years, extend to the complete reconquest of Ukraine as well as of other countries that were formerly part of the Russian Empire in the 19th century and the Soviet Union in the 20th. The objectives he has declared are therefore imperial and territorial in nature. They are not objectives about political systems or values. Therefore, the Russian invasion, if it were to be successful, would open up the possibility of a new era of imperialism and of using control over territory as a strategic weapon. The third important point returns to the questions of question of nuclear weapons, which I addressed earlier. This is the first conflict since the 1950s in which a nuclear superpower has actively and publicly discussed using nuclear weapons. We don't know how seriously this has been discussed by Putin and, and the military leadership of Russia, but we do know that the general threat of using such weapons has formed part of speeches both by President Putin and by his foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov. And we can see that the use of nuclear weapons is openly being discussed on Russia state television in a quite deliberately shocking way. Recently, for example, and this is the Twitter catch of it, one political television show used graphic effects to display what would be the impact of the de detonation by Russia of an underwater nuclear torpedo off the coast of Britain, of how my country would be devastated by a huge tsunami and how radiation would make Britain uninhabitable. This show was in response to a speech by the British Foreign Minister that had evidently annoyed these TV commentators. This may have been inten intended simply to make Russians feel that their military is truly powerful, even while its failures in Ukraine have made it look weak and incompetent. But we know that there is also a military logic that follows from this situation. It is that Russian failure or just weakness in Ukraine carries the possibility that it could lead President Putin to use a nuclear weapon as a desperate display of power to force Ukraine to surrender. We can certainly hope with some justification that the Russian leadership would not in fact use nuclear weapons because they surely know very well 
what would be the consequences, not just for their enemies, but for themselves. Yet the crucial point is that for the first time in many decades, we cannot be sure. And not being sure is a deadly serious fact. That is also why the response to Russia's invasion by the West, led by the United States, strongly followed by European countries and by Japan, has, I would say, been very careful, very unified, and it has been sustained. It has been careful so as to reduce the chance of starting World War III by entering into direct military conflict with a, with a nuclear superpower. It has been unified because all these rich allies share the view that this is a conflict not of local importance, but more global and fundamental. And it has been sustained so far because of the realization shared by the public, I think, that it will only be long-term economic and military pressure that can prevent President Putin from achieving his aims. The conflict and the Western response through unprecedentedly tough economic sanctions imposed by the biggest economic and financial powers on the globe is having a considerable effect on world economic trends. By disrupting supplies of energy and other raw materials, it is provoking inflation. By isolating Russia, the world's 12th largest economy, from many financial, economic, and cultural interchanges with the, with the West, it is hitting globalization quite hard. We cannot know, however, at this stage, what the outcome will be, either militarily or economically, and what kind of consequences will flow from that outcome. What we do know, however, is that the range of possible outcomes is sadly quite wide. So this brings me to the final section of my lecture. My title, after all, promised to ask what we know and what we don't know about the new political and economic order. So now that I've outlined these three major game-changing events and their effects, what are my answers? What do we know and what don't we know? Well, the broad answer is that we know less than we often think we do. So I will start with a general point, which then shapes the rest of my answers. And this is that, as I said earlier, the three major events I've described, trade war, pandemic, war in Ukraine, were all predictable in the strict sense that there were plenty of influential people who said that these things might happen. But they were completely unpredictable in the real sense that we had no way of knowing whether they would actually happen and certainly no idea of when. Similar points can be made about major earlier events that rocked the world, of course, the 9-11 attacks, for example, or the 2008 global financial crisis that I mentioned. The size, complexity, and connectedness of our contemporary global system means that such events can have far bigger impacts than might have been in the case in the past. This impact is the price, if you like, of our human success. But what this amounts to is that in thinking about the world, we need to understand that we are living at a time of radical uncertainty. That concept is one that the great British economist John Maynard Keynes helped to popularize during the 1930s. His point, which has been emphasized again in a fine recent book by two current British economists, Mervyn King, former governor of the Bank of England, and John Kay, former professor at London School of Economics, was that it is important when thinking about possible future events to distinguish between risk and true uncertainty. Risks are things we can calculate. We can say that the return from a particular investment or activity must be greater than the calculated risk. But true uncertainty is something we cannot calculate at all. There really was no way to assign a probability to the likelihood of a global pandemic that could kill 20 million people. We just did not and could not know. If we say, using common language, that there is a risk of another pandemic, the point made by King and Kay is that we are thereby misusing the word risk. Of course, it is true that such a risk exists, but we have no way of calculating its, li its likelihood. That likelihood is unknowable. 
The result is that in such conditions of radical uncertainty, it makes little sense to make plans for all sorts of unknowable potential events. And that is why I would argue that most plans for a future pandemic proved useless when the pandemic in fact happened because they were plans that were designed for other types of pandemic. Instead, what we need is to create learning ability and to build adaptability into our systems to respond to, to the major thing that happens. That way, with learning ability, we can be ready for such response. In practice, the great triumph of the pandemic period came from that learning ability adapt and adaptation we learned incredibly rapidly how to make new vaccines. We adapted very rapidly to new ways of working and living. This was a better response than those by much more rigid systems, which took drastic measures still in place in China, like closing borders. So given that condition of ra radical uncertainty that I've mentioned, what else do we know? I would cite only these six big things beyond that value of learning ability. So first, we know that the range of possible futures for humanity is wider than we might have thought. But second, most important in this war, is that we know and must accept that we are in a new age of nuclear weapons in which the possibility of the use of these devastating world-changing weapons is rising. Third, we probably know that unless the Russian regime itself changes as a result of this war, Russia will remain substantially isolated from the West, Europe and America certainly, but I would expect also Japan, for a considerable period of time there will be a kind of a new Cold War between the West and Russia, at least on present trends. But we also know that this isolation is likely to be partial, not complete, for most countries in the world will not be joining in. For, fourthly, we know from the experience both of the pandemic and the war that the, for the time being, the world is not dividing, as some say, into two blocks the West, or democracies, against autocrats, or even the West versus China, but rather that many countries in Asia, Africa, and Latin America especially, are choosing to stay non-aligned for the war, and this is regardless of their political system. They are waiting to see what happens. Also, they know that in a world in which power is widely distributed, it makes no sense for them to join any single camp the world is complicated. It's not simple and binary. We do also know that China, that while China and Russia have set up their strategic partnership, they have not so far begun to make it an operational working relationship, one with firm obligations or commitments to one another. It's a relationship of statements, not of actions. Finally, we know that globalization, for good or for ill, is not dead. It can bring viruses, terrorism, nuclear fallout, but also vaccines, amazing digital technology, growing prosperity, rapid development, and exchange of ideas. But we also know that the factors that globalization depends upon are overwhelmingly political. Long experience should tell us that what we call globalization is a process of responses by private actors, individuals and companies, to political decisions made by governments. No government created globalization or global interchange, but by their combined decisions, they allowed it to happen. And the huge crowd, otherwise known as the market, gave globalization its constantly changing and varied shape. And the short experience of the pandemic, as expressed by the pharmaceutical industry, is that the impulse of the market to exploit those opportunities is enormously powerful, and that over the past two years, no political obstacles have prevented or even substantially weakened that impulse. So on the topic of the global interchange of goods and ideas, what we know is that it would require an enormously powerful and widespread effect 
sorry, effort by political authorities to make a real sustained difference, to put the globalization genie back in the bottle, which probably means we would need a major war for that to happen, a war between economic and political superpowers. Could this war in Europe be or become that war? It is possible, but the point is we do not know. This finally brings us to the list of important things that we do not know, therefore. We do not know whether nuclear weapons will be used in or in connection with the war in Ukraine. We do not know whether China will choose to reinforce or make operational its relationship with Russia or leave it loose as it is today. We do not know whether what we like to call a rules-based order can now be rescued, resurrected, or newly built depending on your point of view about the desirability of that. Global institutions are needed, but they are in severe disrepair. Many countries in the world do not believe such an order really exists. Working to try to create such an order, as Japan has done in Asia through bodies such as the Trans-Pacific Partnership, is very worthwhile. But the construction of such an order, if it can be done, is at the beginning stage from the point of view of many countries, not the end. And new or reinforced global, global institutions would depend critically on the superpowers. Thus, finally, and most important of all, what we do not know is whether in this era of great power competition, the US and China are desti destined to collaborate, compete, or even to fight. There are ample reasons to speculate, by, speculate about any of these directions of movement. All are possible, but we just don't know. There are, of course, many, many other things we do not know. But what I want to leave you with, ladies, ladies and gentlemen, is this idea that the range of our possible futures has become wider than we might have thought. It is, I know, almost banal to say it. The future will be whatever we make it. But it is something we can easily forget when we make great assumptions, build great narratives, and look for great historical trends. We are not in an age of inevitability. We are in an age of radical uncertainty. Thank you for listening, ladies and gentlemen, so patiently. And I look forward to your ideas and any questions that you might have. Thank you very much.